Hello, good morning, good afternoon, and uh, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Jeff Bradley. I am Director of the Commission on International Education at NIASC, uh, welcoming uh, you to day three. I know some, some of you have already tuned in as part of the uh, uh, celebration of student talent. It's my pleasure today to introduce to all of you Nalini Cook, who is Director of Research for ISC Research. We at NEASC depend on solid information, information from schools, and in the case of ISC Research, information on the environment of international schools. ISC Research has been in this business since 1994, and they are the leading provider of English medium K through 12 international school data, uh, intelligence, and, and trends. It's important for heads of school uh, to be aware of what um, ISC research is uh, uncovering and important to many others out there, including uh, accreditors. Uh, they also publish International School Leader magazine, a periodical of interest to uh, readers around the world. Um, accreditation at its core is about uh, uh, pro uh, promoting trust. Cred is in the middle of that word accreditation. And you'll be surprised, I think, to find how few schools, proportional to the overall number of international schools, have accreditation uh, from a, a recognized uh, uh, third, bar uh, third party. Uh, and that's one of the reasons that we wanted to bring uh, Nalini Cook here uh, today to share with our audience um, a little bit more about the landscape of international schools, and in particular about the landscape of accreditation, and there's some helpful data uh, on our family of international schools uh, around the world. Uh, as of our um, latest tally, uh, we have somewhere around 90 countries um, sending um, or participating uh, in this conference this week, uh, more than 90 countries. And we're, we're, we're thrilled that we have that much of a um, global appeal. Um, and in that um, uh, spirit, let me introduce to you uh, Nalini Cook, who will be um, joining me on the screen in just a moment um, and going through a slide deck. And then uh, we'll have some time, 15 minutes or so at the end uh, for some questions. So Nalini, uh, over to you. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you for such a kind introduction and for inviting me to speak uh, at NIASC here today. Um, if I could have the first slide, please. So as you'll see on the screen in just a moment, um, I'm going to be taking a look today, as Jeff said, at the world's international school market and the place of accreditation within it. Um, next slide. And as Jeff mentioned, I'm uh, head of EMEA research at ISC. Um, so I cover the research areas of Europe, the Middle East and North Africa. Um, and I'm working with international schools throughout those regions. But as an organization, we spend um, our time tracking the world's international schools. Uh, we track the markets, we, we gather and supply intelligence and data on global, regional, and local market changes, trends, and developments. Right now, given the, the current climate in particular, our research is providing some really quite important independent analysis for established schools, as well as market intelligence and data for education suppliers and crucial market insights and understanding for schools within their development cycle. Today, I'm going to be drawing on some of our most recent research to give you a picture of where the international schools market stands, but also the place of accreditation within that. I'm going to provide a bit of a deeper dive into some of the countries where NIAS schools operate, as well as some more general trends that we're seeing uh, globally in the international schools world. There's quite a lot of data to get through. Um, Forgive me if I get a bit hoarse towards the end. You're very, very welcome, as Jeff said, to ask questions um, at any point in the presentation. Uh, there's a, a chat function box for that. Um, I'll be happy to answer any questions that I can at the end. Um, and you're, of course, welcome to contact me directly uh, later if you so desire. So slide three. For those of you who aren't yet familiar with ISE research, if you haven't come across us before, 
Um, we track, as I said, the world's K through 12 international schools market. And we're considered uh, the recognized source of data as well as intelligence on development trends and shifts within that market. Our research on international schools is often quoted in respected media such as the BBC and the New York Times, as well as by various industry publications around the world. We also work really closely with uh, various schools, school groups, um, investors and developers, associations, accreditors, um, education suppliers and lots of higher education institutes too. As you can see on the slide in front of you right now, there are many different ways in which our work supports the industry. But most people today, I expect, will be listening in from schools themselves. So one of the most important ways that we support you is keeping international schools themselves informed on the market, not just locally, but uh, regionally and globally. We, we try to guide school leaders where, where they would like to be gu uh, guided with their strategic planning and benchmarking, um, providing data and intelligence to help support recruitment, um, admissions, and of course, development decisions. Next slide, please. So before we begin a deeper dive into the data, I'd like to just provide a little bit of context, um, uh, beginning with how the international schools market has changed over the last 30 years and of course, where it will go from here. But to answer that and many of the other questions we're going to address today, it's important to understand what we at ISC consider to be an international school for the purposes of our data collection. Now, we're very inclusive at ISC and we use quite a broad criteria for the purposes of um, this analysis and uh, data collection. So for ISC to include an international school, it must fit one of two uh, criteria. And the first is either the school delivers a curriculum to any combination of preschool, primary or secondary students wholly or partly in English outside of an English speaking country. Alternatively, it should be a school in a country where English is one of the official languages, but where it offers an English medium curriculum other than the country's national curriculum and the school is international in its orientation. So a British curriculum school in India or um, an IB school in Ireland are both good examples of schools that would fit that second criteria. Now, if you look at the charts you can see on screen, uh, you can see that they show broadly an 80-20 split um, in the student demographic of locals versus expatriates. And that's been flipped pretty much uh, exactly in the last 30 years since ISC began researching the market. The left pie illustrates the traditional model of an international school in the 1990s. That would have been typically either an embassy or a community school, predominantly serving the dependents of Western expatriate professionals and typically delivering a really uh, a nationalistic US or UK curriculum and teaching entirely in the English language. Fast forward to 2019, and as many of you will be aware, this model has been replaced. Um, it's a much broader range of school types and curricula these days, including a growing number of bilingual schools. These schools serve a wide range of student demographics with expatriates from both the East and the West, as well as a huge increase in the number of local children attending these international schools. Now, looking at 2020 and beyond, the coronavirus pandemic has obviously impacted the sector in many ways in the short term and most likely in the longer term too. We're yet to see the full extent of the impact, but it certainly includes enrolment and staffing and the effects are likely to be felt for the next few years. It's already clear that the severity of the impact associated with the pandemic differs depending on location and, and how various different governments have reacted. But I'll come back to the pandemic and the emerging trends from that a little bit later on. For now, I'd like to take a look at what the existing key drivers for the international schools market are. Next slide, please. As you can see here, there are a number of drivers currently affecting the international schools market. I'll go through some of them uh, in just a little bit more detail. Um, one of the things that we're seeing that's really driving uh, some growth is 
that many governments in developing countries are now recognising international schools as a route to improving their own K through 12 education um, quickly and effectively. A really good recent example of this is in Malaysia. And just last month, November 2020, the Malaysian government announced it's going to open five uh, state secondary schools running international curriculums. Um, the first is due to open in 2023. And that really demonstrates their recognition of international schools as an important route to good English language skills and quality education. In many instances, this kind of recognition that we see at a number of other countries as well has led to government reform um, around their own local education. So reducing limitations for local children who can attend international schools, for example. But in some other regions, government restrictions on local students attending uh, still remain. This can obviously limit uh, international schools growth in the areas, but interestingly, it can also fuel um, demand and growth. And that's what we've seen with the movement of some Chinese families to other countries where their international school education is fully accessible and more affordable compared to what uh, Chinese families can access within China itself. Another driver for the growth in the market is an increased interest in international school places from expatriate professionals originating from Asia, not just the West. Um, so as economic growth uh, is happening in, in many of these countries, there's an increasing need for differing regional talent. The slimming down or the, the loss entirely in some cases of generous employee benefits packages that's becoming more and more common, um, that's resulting in an increased demand for more affordable schools. So families now need to be able to afford international education without those additional allowances on top of basic salaries. There's also a real desire for curricula with global perspectives, although local context still remains important. Um, many parents and ministries want their children to maintain strong connections to their local culture and language and heritage. Um, some governments have been known to introduce legislation which favours schools that offer bilingual provision, uh, therefore giving them the best of both worlds. Premium schools continue to be popular. I think that's come as a surprise to, uh, to some people, particularly in the wake of, uh, of COVID, but their popularity continues. Um, it's one of the areas of the market where we've seen some quite major growth. Um, and we're seeing a real um, trend coming out in these premium schools, which is that of um, independent schools, typically from the US and the UK, although also a few from Australia, um, taking their brand and opening a sister school overseas. Um, so Dwight and Chandwick are good examples of schools that have done that. Um, and as a result of COVID-19, we're also hearing a lot about parents who would traditionally have sent their child to board overseas in the US or the UK um, for a standard of education that they desired. Those parents, not all of them, but a significant amount of those parents are now looking at these branded schools or premium international schools that are closer to home in their local neighbourhoods that are offering what they consider to be the same product without having to have their child so far away from them. It's particularly a big trend in China. The biggest growth driver, though, and this has been consistent throughout the last 20 years, is, is this desire for um, a really a reliable pathway to higher education. So the provision of learning in English and acquiring qualifications that are globally recognised um, is incredibly poor, important to, to parents who are looking for international schools. Obviously, time will tell now how COVID-19 uh, impacts this enormous movement of international students for undergraduate and uh, postgraduate studies. Um, in order to attract the same number of students, there's likely to be some quite uh, significant changes universities have to make. But for now, that demand is still there uh, for that access to higher education. So now that we've considered what's driving the demand, let's look at how the demand's grown and where we're up to in 2020. Next slide, please. I'm constantly asked about the headline numbers for the overall schools market. Um, so here they are. Um, I'll give you just a moment to quickly read through those. Um, some of them might surprise you.
you can see the incredible growth there's been in the market from the year 2000, which we took as a data point to where we are currently at 2020. So at the end of the 2019-2020 school year, as you can see, there were 11,616 international schools around the world, enrolling 5.98 million students and generating a total fee income based on tuition fees alone of 54 billion US dollars. Now, over the past 20 years, the market has grown by 349% in the number of schools, 518% in student enrollment, and by 1,002% in total income from school fees. Now, this data, as you'll see at the bottom left of the screen there, um, is taken from a data point in summer of this year. Now, our research teams have obviously been gathering data about enrollments and staffing for the 2020-21 academic year. Um, and that's been completed uh, over the last two months. We're almost there with that, but just not quite ready, uh, not confident that we've got it for everywhere just yet. So that continues, but we will have updated market trends in January, which you'll be able to see um, then. But I can tell you that as of now, um, so the 1st of December, I took a data point reading and there were 12,011 international schools. So it's, it's risen, um, enrolling 6.7 million students. Um, and it shows no sign of stopping. So some quite dramatic figures there, I think you'll agree. Next slide, please. Now, this slide shows you a macro view of where today's international schools are located. So this is every school that fits one of those criteria that I mentioned earlier that ISC uh, considers an international school, all recorded in, in one, one region or another. And this data is taken from September 2020. Um, Asia, as you might expect, continues to expand its domination of the market. It now has 57% of the international schools, which means it's teaching 3.74 million students and generating tuition fees of 32.3 billion US dollars. Next slide. Now, there are 22 subregions in the world. Here you're going to see the top 10 for the number of international schools. Western Asia, which you see at the top there, that has the most international schools in the world. Now, we use the term Western Asia, which is the UN definition for the Middle East, excluding Egypt. Um, and they have 15.9% of the total market and 28.5% of the total enrollment. So quite large numbers at their schools um, is the implication there. Next slide. Now, this slide shows a breakdown of the four most popular curricula at international schools around the world from both five years ago in 2015 and also from last month so that you can see the growth over the last five years. The, the numbers that you see there refer to the number of schools offering that particular curriculum. As you can see, there's been growth in all the curricula, which you would expect given the growth in the overall market. Um, but if you look at the bottom row, it's evident that the Cambridge programme is experiencing the most significant growth here in the sector. One of the things that is driving that is this increase in, in bilingual schools, which I'll come to in just a moment, um, as well as a lot of schools, particularly in Latin America and in um, India, where schools are teaching perhaps a more generic international curriculum, um, but culminating in the UK examinations of either GCSE, IGCSE, A-levels or IA-levels. So these curricula are changing and they're evolving as the market does. There's an increasing number of hybrid models like those bilingual schools that I mentioned. Um, and lots of people are combining various strands of national and international um, curricula. It's It's increasingly important um, to both schools and local governments that uh, curricula imp incorporate some elements of the national curriculum of the country. As long as a school is teaching in at least 50% or more English medium, we would include them in our criteria. The other thing that many schools are currently looking for is flexibility. They're really looking for that flexibility to be able to adapt um, to the needs of their location, their student base and uh, the school strengths within their curriculum. Next slide. 
Now on this slide, you can see the three most popular exit examinations offered by international schools that serve children up to the age of 18. As you know, these are the qualifications recognised by most good universities around the world. And as I mentioned earlier, it's that pathway to higher education that's one of the main drivers for enrolment at international schools. International schools are currently setting very high grade standards, which is one of the success factors of the international schools market. On average, international school students are achieving a higher examination success from their exit exams than students sitting the same exams in other schools. Many parents who send their child to an international school have, have really quite high academic aspirations for them. And so average grade scores are really, really important to them. They're also important uh, not only for marketing and enrollment purposes at the international schools, but also for the higher education institutes. Um, so universities around the world are actively seeking out students with this kind of academic excellence. But why else do parents seek out international schools for children? Well, ISC is currently completing some research on this very question. So look out for an upcoming white paper on the topic. But one of the reoccurring discussion points that's come out of our research over the last couple of months has been that parents often find it hard to understand what it is that quantifies quality at an international school, particularly in those countries where there's no local regulation or inspection. Um, and this is often where accreditation comes in. Next slide. So you can see here the logos of some of the accreditation bodies most commonly used by international schools. Now, accreditation, as you may well be aware, originated over 100 years ago in the US, and it was a purpose of standardization between secondary education and higher education institutes. So a university or a higher ed establishment could trust that the standard of education and the student emerging from an accredited school would be able to cope with and contribute to their offered programs. Today, that accreditation has developed a, a much wider purpose. Um, it can help schools work towards and develop quality standards. And that in turn reassures both parents and indeed prospective teachers that they're considering a school of a certain standard as evidenced by a quality mark. Accreditation agencies are increasingly challenging schools to do more, and they're providing support, professional development, and even content on a variety of issues that affect the international schools. One really good example um, of late is that of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, initiatives in these areas are really increasing as a result of events in 2020. And they've been widely supported by accreditors around the world through, through research, collaboration, professional development, um, giving ideas for practical steps and indeed recognition of successes. So this is just one of the ways that international schools are supported by accreditation organisations. Next slide, please. Now, this slide shows the number of schools accredited by each of the main international school bodies um, based on the ISC research data from September of this year. It illustrates how important accreditation is to international schools, but also I think interestingly how much room there it still is in the international market for accreditors and for their support, particularly in comparison to the saturation that there is perhaps in domestic markets. Next slide. So, as we're all here as part of the, the NIASC conference today, let's take a bit of a closer look at the NIASC accredited international schools in particular. So, as you can see, we've got 236,900 children currently enrolled in 262 NIASC accredited international schools, and they're achieving a high level of learning commensurate with NIASC accreditation standards. Now, those schools have 26,900 staff working at them, and those teachers are helping to raise the bar for this quality teaching within the sector. The average annual tuition fee for a NIASC accredited international school is 16,042 US dollars. 
Now you'll see below that the average annual tuition fee globally for an international school, so not an accredited, not a NEASC accredited school, is 8,623 US dollars. And for a premium international school is 12,488 US dollars. I think what's particularly interesting here is that average of tuition fee for a NEASC accredited school is almost double the average tuition fee of all international schools. And when you compare the average tuition of premium international schools to NEASC schools, it's clear that those schools who have NEASC accreditation are able to command that higher fee, which in turn results in higher quality staff and facilities and resourcing, and ultimately is setting higher standards. So it has a, a cyclical effect. Next slide, please. Now, as Jeff mentioned in his introduction, NIESC School Accreditation is, is spread around the world. We're joined by people from all over the world at the conference. Um, there is a chance, therefore, for NIAS to influence and set standards in all the subregions, which can only be a positive thing. Here you can see the top 10 subregions for NIASC accredited schools. And if we move on to the next slide, please, you can now see the top 10 countries within those subregions. The UAE is at the top, um, which you might expect, given that Western Asia was top of the previous slide. Um, and I'm going to take a look now very quickly at some of the headline data for just a few of these top few countries uh, for NIASC accredited schools, as it's likely that some of the people listening in today are going to be from schools in those countries. So next slide. Let's start with the, the UAE as the most populous. So the UAE, United Arab Emirates, boasts the most NIASC accredited schools uh, in one country. That is obviously outside of uh, the United States. There are 32 NIASC accredited schools spread across the three most popular emirates in the uh, country. So that would be Dubai, Sharjah and Abu Dhabi. Now, the UAE is the third largest country in the world for the number of international schools in total. They've got 725 different international school campuses and they're the leading country in the world for student enrollment. So just under 700,000 students attend one of these international schools. That gives you an idea of the size, and it really is quite a significant size of the market. The country's seen a total enrollment growth in the last 10 years of 13.7%, and the average annual tuition fee at international schools in the UAE is 8,478 US dollars a year. Next slide. Now, Germany is the 20th country in the world for the total number of international schools with 176 schools. They're the 16th country in the world for student enrollment with just shy of 95,000 students attending international schools. And as you can see there, NIASC has 19 accredited schools operating in Germany at present. Now, enrollment growth in Germany um, which is reflective of most of Europe, to be honest, has, has remained um, pretty stable over the last 10 years. So there's a growth of 1.9% and we're seeing that slow and steady growth throughout Europe. But um, the average tuition fee is pretty strong in Germany. It's 13,188 US dollars a year. So although the market's not growing at the speed that it is in, in, in the Middle East or um, in parts of Asia, it is still an incredibly strong market. Next slide. So let's move on to India. NIASC has 11 accredited schools there. The country is the second largest in the world for international schools. So they've got 754 international schools at the moment, and they're second also for enrollment. Um, it's a significantly growing market, again, as you might expect, given the things that I've mentioned about bilingualism and um, uh, this, this desire for uh, higher education path pathways. Um, they've had an enrollment growth of 7% over the last 10 years. Now, comparatively speaking, though, the Indian market has a very low average school fee. So for international schools in India, we're looking at an average tuition fee of 
3,346 US dollars a year. So quite different to what we've seen in the last two slides and also quite different to what we're going to see now in the next slide. So China, um, as I said, the, the, the fee point is, is an awful lot higher. Um, now, China's not a significant market for NIASC accredited schools just yet, but I've included it here because it's one of the leading countries for international schools. It's gained huge um, attention and it's attracting a great deal of demand at the premium end of the market, particularly with those international school brands. You can see the very high average annual tuition fee there, right at the bottom. Um, it's a relatively new market for international education, um, particularly international education that's accessible to local children. Um, but given that student enrollment's fairly high at 400,000 uh, students attending some form of international education in the country. The market's incredibly segmented in China though. And the reason for this is government regulations limit Western education for Chinese children. So in China, Chinese children can only attend um, international schools for the non-compulsory years of education. And in China, that is pre-grade one or post-grade nine. So that being said, Chinese parents are increasingly investing in their child's education. And there is this huge desire, particularly amongst wealthy, um, educated middle class and young Chinese parents for a Western style um, bilingual education. So the most prolific growth of international education in China is within what we call Chinese owned private schools. So these are highly regulated, but they do provide some opportunities for a Western style of pedagogy and curriculum at those uh, grade levels that I mentioned, um, including for international exit examinations for local Chinese children. Now, Chinese owned private school numbers have grown 44% in the last five years, and enrollment is up 70%. Now, with this growth, we can see 59% of all students attending international schools in China are Chinese nationals. As I mentioned briefly earlier, we're also seeing significant movement of Chinese families who are unable to access that international education in China, relocating to other Southeast Asian countries where there is no such regulation and where fees are much more affordable which takes us to the next slide. And we're looking at Southeast Asia here. So for ISC, we include Malaysia, Indonesia, Cambodia, Vietnam, Brunei, the Philippines, Myanmar, Thailand, and Singapore within the Southeast Asia region. Now again, NIAS doesn't have a strong presence here yet, but it is a huge sub-region for international schools. And it's seeing really some quite significant growth. So an increase in accreditation in the next few years is to be expected. Um, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand and Viet Vietnam in particular all have a significant number of international schools and growing enrollment. So it's definitely a region to watch. Next slide. Now, with regards to the curricula offered by NIASC inter accredited international schools, the most favoured curricula, as you can see on the screen there on the left, are the International Baccalaureate Diploma Program and or the US curriculum schools. Now, if you're worried that the figures on the red graph add up to more than 100 percent, this is because many schools offer more than one curriculum or examination at a time. So, for example, a school might offer a UK curriculum culminating in the IBDP or um, a US curriculum, but offer A-levels alongside. So there are uh, combinations there. You can see on the right in blue, a comparison to the popularity of curricula at international schools overall. Next slide. Now, this is the exit examinations at NIAS schools and then in the world overall. So 61% of all NIASC accredited international schools offer the IB diploma. This, as you can see, is, is quite a significant difference to the percentage of total international schools. One of the other things more widely offered at accredited schools in comparison to the total international schools is governance. If I could have the next slide, please. Now, last year, 
ISC Research published a governance report in conjunction with the Principals Training Centre, highlighting how governance varies quite significantly from one international school to another and the roles that governing bodies play within international schools. Most international school board members are responsible for making a variety of important strategic decisions. And yet two aspects of governance really stood out amongst uh, the majority of international schools. Firstly, very few schools invest in training or development for their board members. Secondly, those schools that do offer training tend to offer it for induction to the governing body only. So just 39% of schools uh, surveyed said that their board members participate in continued professional development. Just 18% had a board member represent the school at a conference or event during the past year. And just 15% um, send board members to international school leadership conferences. Next slide. The governance report also highlighted potential weaknesses in board evaluation. 63% um, of the schools that were surveyed said their governing body self-evaluates. Less than half, um, just 43 schools, seek external assessment through accreditation or other means. And 14% of schools said there is currently no assessment in place at all for their governing body. Um, some did say they were in the they were putting self-evaluation in place, but that's still a significant number that had uh, no accountability. It's interesting to note that of all the schools surveyed, 57% said that board members are self-perpetuating. That is that the board votes for its own replacement board members. Um, and 50% of schools that were surveyed said their board had no elected members at all. Um, it was simply appointment. With 69% of the schools surveyed stating that their board members had a tenure policy of over five years on their governing body, there is huge room for training and professional development to help inform that decision making at a board level. Seeking out accreditation from a well-respected accrediting body can provide schools with a much needed source of support and resources for their governing bodies, as well as continuing excuse me, professional development and events. If you'd like to have a copy of this, uh, this governance report, you can access it and all of our other specialist reports. Um, it's online for free at uh, iscresearch.com. Now, I promise to take a look at some of the trends we're currently seeing in the international school world, and I am conscious of time. So let's move on to have a look at those. Next slide, please. Now, there are some notable trends within international school types, and some of these are responding directly to demand that the market is seeing. The slide that you're looking at now shows international schools broken down by some of the most common types. In a more volatile market, such as the one that we're obviously seeing right now, some defining factors are really making a, a strong impact on enrollment success. So bilingual provision is an incredibly important factor. Um, I mentioned that earlier and this demand from both governments and parents for not just quality um, English language proficiency um, and perhaps Western pedagogy, but also for local cultural and language considerations. If your school does offer bilingual provision, this is a really important feature to highlight at the moment, particularly to local families. As I mentioned earlier, Although accreditation wasn't originally established for this reason, it is now an important third party testimony to school standards. Um, if your school is accredited, you currently remain in the minority. And this is the figure Jeff was referring to earlier. Only 14 percent of the entire international schools market is accredited. As more people view accreditation as an evidence standard, we're expecting that to, to that figure to uplift in the coming years. But right now, if you are an accredited school, whether that's with NIASC or any other accrediting body, you really are in um, a, a quality minority. I've also mentioned foreign independent school brands being in demand by you know, the wealthiest, the, the brand conscious uh, parents, particularly in China and some of the major cities in Southeast Asia. Although these schools are really quite high profile in the cities where they're located, they do only make up 1% of the entire international schools market. 
But the market sector is growing. And as NIASC has such a large number of schools who operate in the domestic market, but might be considering um, an overseas expansion, I'll just take a quick look at those um, independent school brands operating overseas as a sector of the market in a bit more detail. Um, next slide, please. So independent school brands, particularly those from the US uh, and the UK, um, are increasingly establishing a presence overseas and nowhere more so than within the Chinese owned private school sector. Those schools that I mentioned earlier that can offer some form of international education to Chinese children. It is a small sector of the wider market, but it is a really prominent one. Um, these schools offer an education option that many of um, many of these parents are seeking because of its educational prestige, because of their direct associations with the best universities, um, their strong focus on academic success and their development of leadership qualities, um, their powerful, their long lasting alumni and, of course, high performing arts and sports programs. There are 94 of these schools in China alone. 44 of these schools have their founding schools in Great Britain. Um, there's quite a few from the US as well. Prominent brands include places like Dulwich College, um, where else? Uh, Wellington and the HD schools, which are often rebranded to offer a product um, that is more of a blended product for the Chinese market. Um, there are an astounding 43 Chinese private schools affiliated with a foreign brand still planned to open in China in the coming three years. So it is a market of its huge growth and it bears watching. Next slide, please. Southeast Asia is also a region that offers excellent potential for prestigious international schools. Um, I won't go through them all in detail, but you can see there that there are international schools operating in all of those uh, countries there. But it's not all about high end premium international school demand. Next slide. There is a higher demand in a growing number of countries for international schools with tuition fees that are more affordable. This is partly because local families are seeking out good but reasonably priced international schools and of course because more expatriate families are having to fund their children's education from their own salaries. This year for the first time we're going to be publishing data on the mid-market international schools. Here you can see some data for um, both the mid-market and the premium sectors in Cambodia and Singapore and I've chosen those two countries because there is such a notable noticeable difference in the um, average annual fees between the two. Um, lower fees obviously impact the potential for higher staff to student ratios, um, the experience of teachers and facilities, etc. But on this basis, as you can see here, mid-market schools in Singapore are still bringing in a, a higher fee than premium schools in Cambodia. So that does have an impact on what schools can deliver in different countries. So we're going to be keeping a closer eye on this market um, as it continues to grow. And of course, that data will be freely available for you as well. Next slide. Now, it goes without saying that the past 12 months have been a massively challenging time for all international schools. A significant number of schools provide prove themselves, sorry, to, to be resilient, to be flexible um, and responded incredibly well to campus closures. But there were many that weren't prepared for such an extended period away from their physical school campus. For example, uh, Chinese schools were particularly badly impacted as COVID hit the country when many teachers and children were actually outside of China um, for Chinese New Year. So as a result, schools there really needed to develop a particularly robust uh, digital learning program to accommodate for the different regions both staff and students found themselves in while those travel bans lasted. Next slide. Looking at longer term impacts, though, as we hopefully emerge from this pandemic in the coming months, what, what has COVID changed about international schools? Well, the general consensus is that international schools on the whole have been delivering well-structured, resilient and quite creative distance learning, and they've supported their students throughout. The offering is often considered of a higher standard than that at many national schools, 
And affluent parents may well see international schooling as more dependable than uh, the, the local uh, provision. As a result of coronavirus, I mentioned this earlier, a lot of families are proving to be a little bit more cautious about sending their child to board overseas. They're wanting to keep them closer to home. We're certainly aware of schools that are based in areas that are heavily invested in uh, by tourism um, and housing perhaps a more transient population. They're also suffering more. Um, so where international schools are dependent on the local market, campuses are coping um, somewhat better as, a as opposed to those that are more dependent on the expatriate market. Um, there have been reports suggesting we might well see a fall in the supply of international teachers again worldwide. Now, whether this plays out over the next year, we'll have to wait and see. We do know that schools are having to be a bit more creative in their staff offerings. Um, to give expatriate teachers the support that they need at this time. Um, there's been less teacher churn this year, which has been encouraging as teachers seek to maintain a little bit of stability in this uncertain world. Um, but a lot of schools are anticipating that there will be um, a lot more churn in the market next year um, as, as people want to perhaps return closer to home. There are a lot of children who continue to be isolated with various national restrictions um, going on. So although they can perhaps take part in schooling, they can no longer do things like sporting or other extracurricular activities. And that's obviously had an impact on well-being and the way that schools have had to support parents and indeed, uh, sorry, support children, but also parents. Um, there's a notable cohort, small but still notable, of families who in some countries are still not allowing their children to return to face-to-face -face learning, even where it is possible as a result of health fears. And there are fears for the, the, the well-being of those children. Um, the economic impact of COVID obviously continues in, in all kinds of industries, but also in education. Um, disposable incomes are becoming less and private education um, does suffer as a result of that. But we do know from previous crises, um, such as the 2008 global financial crisis, that um, many parents still keep their children in international schools, even though they're financially impacted in other aspects of their lives. So we'll have to wait and see how that pans out. Next slide. I've referenced um, a few reports today. Um, we produce at ISC a number of specialist studies, um, white papers, reports on various things, as well as things like the International School Leader magazine that Jeff mentioned. These are all available for, uh, for free to you as uh, international schools on our website. We are currently conducting a wellbeing survey. So if you're an international school leader or a, a teacher, please do participate. The survey is open until the 18th of December. If you um, connect with me or have a look at my LinkedIn profile, I've got a link directly to the survey there or get in touch with me via email later. Next slide, please. We do offer uh, benchmarking as well. Um, we would benchmark on all the typical um, things that you might expect to benchmark a school on. Um, but the one that I'd like to mention today is, of course, you can benchmark on accreditation. Next slide, please. And finally, as an international school, um, anybody who's listening in from an international school today, you have free access to the data yourself at ISC Online for Schools. So we need the, the head or the director of the school to register an account there, and then they can give free access to, uh, to a number of other people within the school to access the data and information and reports yourselves there. Next slide. And all that's left for me to say is, Thank you so much for attending the presentation today. Sorry, I've overrun a little bit, but we do have um, a little bit of time for questions. Jeff, let me hand back to you. Okay, thank you very much, Nalini. And thank you, Selena, backstage for helping advance yeah. those slides so flawlessly for us today. Um, uh, Nalini, that's so much uh, helpful information and, and, and stuff for um, all of us to, um, uh, to digest, well, chew on, digest, and to, and to think about. Um, and in particular, those um, changes that we're in the midst of right now um, and, and what those numbers are going to look like in international schools um, in in the cycles ahead as you all continue doing such helpful research. 
I think we're, uh, and I'm not alone in this, but particularly concerned about the impact on, on t-shirts and on, on international travel. Uh, you know, we saw a huge disruption um, e even within our staff because Trillium, uh, the associate director of our commission, um, based in Shanghai, um, uh, was not able to be to travel back to Shanghai. Uh, and so, and her husband, who's head of the lower school there, um, was conducting remote school from Michigan uh, to Shanghai. Uh, so depending on waves of uh, of this virus, um, that impact could really be significant uh, in an ongoing way. Um, so that will be an interesting data point for us to um, to monitor um, and for individual schools, obviously, um, to be to be focused on. Um, and the magazine coming out in December, I'll point out um, a, a little bit of self-promotion. I have an article in there uh, on a little bit of the, the, the moment that we're in right now and what yes. this might uh, mean for uh, schools, particularly at the high school level um, and, and looking at um, the, the curriculum and the impact um, really school-wide on some of the structures that we have taken for granted for so long, but that have been under threat, standardized testing, for example. Um, you, you mentioned something um, um, that I want to I want to go back to, which is um, the question of how to, how do you um, quantify quality? Now, you're measuring those things that are able to be measured, like how many schools offer uh, the IB curriculum, uh, et cetera. Do you do uh, much in the way of of um, qualitative research in the sense of um of um, what the num what 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 lies behind the numbers? I guess maybe we're thinking about opinion kind of research from the yes. market. So we we have two arms really to what we do. We have a huge swathe of people in data teams who are collecting those facts and figures that you've seen on screen today. But we also have people like myself, and there's a I have a team um, who I work with, and we speak to. I would say approximately a thousand school leaders a year um, between the, the the whole team, and and that could be the head of school or a director of a school. It could be admissions leaders, marketing staff, um, school business managers, and bursars. Those types of people. And essentially, what we're doing when we speak to those people is we're asking these questions. You know, we see what's going on from the figures. What can you tell us about what's actually going on on the ground? Um, why is this happening? What's driving that? Because the figures are incredibly important, but they don't tell the whole story. Um, so yes, we do produce um, research like that. Now, often it's uh, it's provided um, to the uh, the wider school environment through various channels on ISC Online for Schools, through things like the magazine articles. Um, we work with um, people for... Um, I can't think of the word, um, not commission studies, but we, we do. So, for example, we're putting together a study on why exactly parents um, choose to go to an international school for their children. Mm -hmm. um, now, that's involved an awful lot of research, talking to admissions managers and indeed parents themselves and looking at those motivations, which aren't necessarily clear from the figures alone. Right, right. Interesting. Now, mm -hmm. the other figure that I find very interesting from where I sit is that uh, that number of accredited schools has probably been going up, but the percentage of accredited schools has been going down since yeah. 2012 from 17% of international schools, as you define them, uh, to 14% yeah. um, today. <clears throat> Do you have any more to say about why you think schools don't seek accreditation? Yeah, I think there's, um, well, there's a couple of reasons. I think one one thing to note is that the, the major growth that we're seeing in the market in the last few years is definitely of that mid-market sector. Um, so these are schools that don't necessarily cater to um, international um, expatriates. They're possibly catering more towards a local market, mm. although not not always entirely. And local market tends to, in our experience, rely a little bit more on word of mouth and recommendation. They're not so interested in external accreditation. Um, the other thing that I think is worth noting there, though, is that the reason that the percentage has dropped is simply because of the sheer number of international schools that are 
are opening and that growth in the market. Now, with that growth in the market comes, um, well, it, it, it's the inexperience and the newness of a school. So even if you have an experienced mm-hmm. school leader who acknowledges that they want to become accredited, most school leaders will let the school become established for three to five years before they necessarily put that in place, either because the accreditor requires the school to have been operating for a certain number of years, or because quite simply, as one can understand, and particularly at the moment, their hands are busy running day-to-day operations. So there'll be a large number of those overall schools who've been open for less than five years. And they're the schools that I think we will see starting to come through. I think accreditation is becoming more valuable um, to both parents and to schools, but it will take a little bit of time for the growth in the market to have that ripple effect and knock on in towards uh, accreditation. Right, right. I noted your number 262 for NEASC accredited international schools. We have more than 60 schools on top of that number that are in the pipeline that are not yet registered as accredited because they're in process. Uh, We've had four applications in just the last month. Uh, So we are seeing uh, traffic um, of of, that is interest from um, non-accredited schools um, who are seeking the accreditation and the label. And those are from all around the world that we're that we're seeing it. Hey, this has been wonderful. I really appreciate um, all the data. And I know our audience as well um, has found this fascinating. Uh, the deck is available, isn't it, in the um, in the booth? Okay, um, right. Um, I'm going to sign off uh, in just a moment from the main stage, but there uh, will be ongoing um, events happening here on the stage, um, including uh, the uh, Jacob Ludis Award, um, and I believe we have another uh, student performance. Um, and we have a busy morning coming up at 10 o'clock with a Dr. Christopher Emden as our keynote at 10, and more after that as well. Uh, Thanks again for being uh, here for this session today on ISC Research. This is Jeff Bradley signing off.